I'm really excited to be here uh, talking to you about um, some of the work on uh, visual development and amblyopia. Um, and um, you might be wondering, what is amblyopia? Um, amblyopia is a developmental disorder of vision, and it results from abnormal visual experience during an early critical period. Um, and functionally, it's a decrease in um, visual acuity. So clinically, it's, it's diagnosed as uh, a decrease in visual acuity in one eye. Um, and that uh, loss of acuity can't be corrected by just putting on glasses or something like that, or if there's a cataract, removing the cataract. The loss in vision persists after that. Um, and so it's not a structural problem. Uh, it's a functional problem of the brain. Um, it's the most common environmentally induced neurological disorder. Um, and it's the most common cause of monocular vision loss in children, affecting about 3 to 4% of children in the US. Um, there are three general conditions that are most commonly associated with amblyopia. Again, when they occur early in, in postnatal life. One is anisometropia. Um, and there's no pointer uh, on the left. Uh, anisometropia is basically a difference in refractive error between the two eyes. Um, and it's more commonly associated with um, farsighted hyperopic. Um, thank you. Um, uh, refractive errors uh, than uh, with myopic ones. Um, but the point is that there's a difference in um, focus between the two eyes. Um, strabismus is quite common where um, there's a misalignment of the two eyes um, and the child chooses to uh, fixate predominantly with one over the other eye and amblyopia develops uh, as a result in association with that condition. And the third one is some kind of opacity to one eye, like a, a congenital cataract, um, a drooping eyelid, or some other thing that creates an impediment to good um, visual experience through one eye. And so we wonder how amblyopia comes about um, and how does it develop. Um, and I want to take a minute to uh, emphasize some of the things that have been said earlier about the value of an animal model, but in particular in this case. This is something that naturally occurs in 3 to 4% of children, why you need to stu study this in animals. Um, and so it's important to understand that you need to be able to study this condition in environmentally controlled conditions. Because if you think about it, um, amblyopia might present itself in a child sometime at school age when they're having difficulty reading. But in fact, the etiology of that occurred very much earlier. And oftentimes, you don't know what it was. It could have been blur. It could have been a crossed eye. It could have been some other thing. Um, that caused that. So you don't, un you don't know what the conditions are that actually led to that amblyopia or that difficulty in reading um, in, in the wild in humans. So to be able to study this uh, under controlled conditions and study it longitudinally is extremely important. Um, and the second really important reason to study an animal model that you all know is that you can study the underlying neural mechanisms. And in the case of the non-human primate, you can study the underlying neural mechanisms both in the same animal along with the behavior. So you have a nice close correlation between what's going on in terms of the uh, behavioral assay and what's going on in the brain. So we've got an animal model. Why in particular the monkey model? So you've heard a lot about that as well. But in terms of amblyopia in particular, amblyopia I told you is a developmental disorder of vision. Well, you've heard that the visual system of the macaque is structurally and functionally very similar. Uh, to that of the human. And it's important uh, to have an animal model that actually models the system that you care about, which is the human. Um, secondly, what we've demonstrated is that visual development between humans and non-human primates is very, very similar, and I'll show you that. And that's important because you want the developmental mechanisms to be similar in the species that you're studying. Um, and finally, it's very important to understand that amblyopia actually occurs naturally in non-human primates. And this is a, a picture of a naturally strabismic macaque who also developed amblyopia as a result of the strabismus. Um, but we generally study this under experimental conditions. We create conditions that mimic this um, in, in humans and uh, mimic the human conditions in the monkeys. But the fact that it naturally occurs means that you have a system that's very similar and, and uh, sustains insult in a similar way to the human. Um, and finally, the profile of vision loss, as we've demonstrated over many years, is very similar across species. So this is a really good animal model. 
So what does visual development look like in the macaque? This is a slide showing um, grading acuity on the left-hand ordinate, um, uh, reference to uh, more clinically uh, common Snellen acuity on the right. And these are data from individual infant monkeys, um, some tested longitudinally, some cross-sectionally, um, plotted as a function of age and weeks. And you can see that acuity goes from very coarse or very big letters on the eye chart uh, to very fine gradings um, over the, the course of the first postnatal year and asymptotes by the end of the first postnatal year. And you can see that it's a fairly consistent uh, regular developmental progression. Now I'm going to add to it um, group data. These are average data from um, human infants and children at the ages indicated there. Those are the big symbols. And what you can see is that these developmental profiles are almost identical. They're completely overlapping. And the uh, final acuities are very similar in monkeys and humans. And the only trickery here is that human age is plotted in months and monkey age is plotted in weeks. And so in terms of visual development, the nice translation, you can call it a four to one, or um, a nice comparison with is weeks to months in terms of the visual system. Um, and so we have a really strong um, model. Um, and as I told you, acuity is the metric that's uh, used to, uh, to identify amblyopia in children. This is just a cartoon showing you what the view would be like between the two eyes of a child walking around the world that had amblyopia. Um, and so this is the, what was called the fellow eye view, the non-affected eye, and the amblyopic eye view of the same scene over there. And so back when I was a graduate student, sorry, I wanted to know how does this come about? What we knew is that these visual conditions were associated with amblyopia, but there was a lot of debate as to one was one causal, was it not, were they just associated or not? And so I had the opportunity um, to longitudinally test some animals that had um, strabismus that was, was created by just misaligning the visual axes in a young animal. And so this shows acuity as a function of age for each eye of an individual infant monkey. And the animal was made strabismic um, surgically um, at age uh, three weeks. And you can see that acuity tracks nicely, um, even beyond the age at which the strabismus was created. Um, and then there's a setback in acuity of the eye that is strabismic, um, followed by a continuation of development. Um, and so when tested at about a year, when acuity is essentially adult-like in most animals, there's a difference between the eyes, and that difference is amblyopia. And we, proved, we showed that, that the strabismus itself in a normal visual system can cause amblyopia. If we look at the same kind of profile in a whole group of animals, these are um, individual uh, data from a group of animals, um, some of whom were made strabismic at an early age and some of which were not. Um, and you can see the fellow eyes track normally with the, um, with the typical animals. And the filled symbols here I've just added are the data from the amblyopic eyes or the eyes that are destined to become amblyopic in those same animals. And once again, you can see that there's a setback in the developmental profile, but it's not an arrest of development. Development continues, but just more slowly and perhaps over a longer time course. But by the end of uh, the developmental period, and in fact, in this case, we went out to two years, and you see that the difference between the eyes persists. And that's what you would see in that child, if it were a child, as an adult, a different, the, that's the characteristic of amblyopia. Um, so I mentioned that amblyopia is actually a disorder of the brain and not of the eye. And it turns out it's a fairly general disorder. And, and um, uh, this just illustrates the, the um, visual pathways in the primate where um, subcortical visual areas and uh, project to primary visual cortex. And then there are uh, two dominant visual pathways, the dorsal and the ventral streams, um, that are nominally associated with, in the dorsal stream, motion stimuli, and the ventral stream, form stimuli, and form processing. And the point I want to make is that although um, amblyopia is characterized as a deficit in acuity, there are many losses that um, have now been identified, some for the first time in macaques and others for the, for the first time in humans, um, that occur in, um, in correlation with amblyopia. And so things like um, um, stereoacuity losses, losses in global motion discrimination. We think of it as a form vision deficit, but there are losses in motion sensitivity in addition 
to those losses. Perceptual organization, higher order form uh, vision losses, natural scene perception. These are all things that have been demonstrated now to be deficient also in many amblyopes. And importantly, um, they are things that are not easily treated um, given the current uh, treatment um, uh, methods that are being used. Um, now I also want to point out um, that um, these different visual functions develop differentially. And what I'm showing you here is, is actually a metric for spatial vision that goes beyond acuity and describes spatial vision across a whole range of spatial scales. And so what you can see here, uh, if, you're, if you're close, you will see this better than if you're in the back of the room. But this is a grading that varies in spatial frequency from left to right and reduces in contrast as you go higher. And depending on where you're sitting in the room, you'll be able to plot out your own contrast sensitivity function, which is basically an inverted U-shaped function. And it gives you um, your sensitivity across spatial scale um, for, for your visual system. Um, and these are contrast sensitivity functions for two amblyopic macaque monkeys. On the left, a strabismic amblyope, and on the right, an anisometropic amblyope. Again, showing sensitivity or contrast sensitivity as a function of spatial scale. And the relevant point to acuity would be the point at which these curves cut off or extend down to the x-axis. So the, the, the cutoffs are like the acuity metrics that I've shown you before. But what this shows is that there's a loss of sensitivity across a whole range of spatial scales, not just in terms of acuity, not just in terms of fine vision. And so um, even at um, you know, moderate spatial scales, there's a loss of sensitivity in the amblyopic eyes. And this is uh, an anisometropic amblyope showing uh, the same thing in a human, um, tested under similar conditions in our lab. And so it's not just the case that the monkeys show these disorders, humans show them as well. Um, these are contrast sensitivity data from uh, a human uh, that w had a congenital cataract. Um, and the cataract was removed at a fairly young age, but the child suffered visual deprivation in the eye that had the congenital cataract. And um, you can see that there's a, there's a big amblyopia across a whole range of spatial scales. So uh, vision is really very poor in this child. Um, the animal model uh, that, that was supposed to represent a congenital cataract case was the one that you may all be familiar with. It was first uh, created by Hubel and Diesel back in the 60s. It's a monocular deprivation model meant to reflect cataract, uh, cataract, cataracts in children. Um, and um, what I'm showing you on the left are data from Ron Harworth's lab, contrast sensitivity for each eye of an animal that was raised with monocular deprivation and uh, by lid suture in this case. And so you can see that the deprived eye has very, very poor, really, well, about, about the level of a rodent uh, vision. Maybe, maybe not as good as the mouse. Um, but in any case, the fellow eye looks quite good. So this is hugely devastating um, to, to have this kind of uh, deprivation. But what I'm showing you on the right um, is that if you do that uh, same procedure at a much older age, something like 18 months in a monkey, or if a cataract develops late, maybe five or six years in a child, um, then you won't have the same level of, de um, of devastation to the visual system. You'll still have some uh, amblyopia, but it will not be as dramatic. And what that demonstrates, um, and, and what uh, Hubel and Wiesel made a, a huge point about uh, with their work, is that illustrates the existence of the early critical period or sensitive period for vision. Um, you've already heard a little bit about sensitive periods. Um, there are sensitive periods for virtually everything um, in terms of development, uh, whether it's the heart or, or the visual system. And it's the period of time um, during development when, when, in this case, visual system can be, um, can be affected by abnormal visual experience. It's the time period during which the system is, is vulnerable. Um, classically, in vision, uh, the sensitive period had been considered to be synonymous with the period of development itself. Um, this slide obviously is in German, uh, but it's a nice uh, rendition by uh, uh, Bangarter, 1959, of um, the, the development of visual potential, uh, visual function, 
um, as a function of age in kids, but it also shows the important aspect of the visual, the, of the critical period, which is early on in visual development, um, the visual system is very sensitive to abnormal experience, um, and that developmental potential, as you will, as you will um, declines with age. So as visual function improves, the ability to change the visual system declines uh, dramatically. And, and in point of fact, um, the, the um, critical period was considered to be synonymous with the period of maturation. But in fact, if you think about it, there's really several different um, critical periods all interleaved with one another. Um, one is the period of maturation, of course, but also there's a period of sensitivity deprivation itself, which is not the same as the period of maturation. And also you consider the period of sensitivity to recovery. So treatment actually can be done beyond the period of maturation. It's not as effective, but you can effect treatment beyond that. And so you really have three different sensitive periods for this process. Um, they're not completely coincidental, but they are overlapping. And it's important to realize that because different visual functions develop differently, that the sensitive periods for these different visual functions are also going to be different. Um, so I've shown you before the um, <coughs> development of spatial resolution. I'm just going to show you two other um, visual functions that develop over very different time courses. And this is temporal modulation sensitivity, just the sensitivity to temporal variation uh, with really no spatial component whatsoever. And so temporal contrast sensitivity as a function of age and weeks develops very, very early in asymptotes before six months in macaque monkeys. Um, whereas on the other end of the spectrum, we have a perceptual organization ability called contour integration, which is a figure ground task. Um, sort of uh, rendition, uh, there's a rendition up here. Um, and um, the ability to extract this figure from ground, which is a circle in this case, um, develops very, very late. Um, most animals couldn't even do this task before they were five or six months of age, and then develops over a longer, slower uh, time course. So you have very different developmental profiles for different visual functions. They have different sensitive periods. And you should keep that in mind when we're talking about the treatment for amblyopia, uh, because some of these later developing functions may actually be vulnerable to deprivation at the time when you're actually trying to impact um, and affect change in a positive direction. So this just stacks up a whole bunch of different visual functions. I don't expect you to be able to parse them all out. But I want to make the point, and it's easy to see here if you pin them all at adult levels. Um, that as a, as a function of age, you see different developmental profiles for different functions. And these over here, um, the ones I mentioned, motion, motion sensitivity, contour integration, that develop late um, are much more vulnerable to abnormal visual experience over a long period of time. And compared with acuity, um, the deficits in these kinds of problems um, tend to be worse. So what I've illustrated here is, is some data on contour integration over here and another kind of global form organization task over here where you're um, uh, extracting a structure from what looks like a noise field. Um, and, and what this shows is the interocular ratio um, between the eyes of amblyopic animals as a function of the depth of amblyopia of those individuals. And these are individual data and they're um, from, from animals that are either strabismic or anisometropic amblyopes created experimentally. And what you can see is that for very mild amblyopes, often these functions aren't affected at all. Um, but for the deeper amblyopes, there's no particular correlation between the depth of amblyopia um, and the loss on this kind of task. Um, but uh, it tends to be much greater uh, so the form vision, the global form vision, perceptual organization kinds of tasks are affected to a greater degree than just acuity. And these are not treated at all. Um, these points up here, by the way, uh, illustrate that some animals couldn't do the task at all with their amblyopic eye uh, in those cases. Um, so what is the treatment? The canonical treatment um, for centuries, actually, has been patching the good eye. Um, so basically, you're effecting um, monocular deprivation on the good eye of the amblyopic child. 
Um, and here's uh, Lucy wearing an eye patch um, and reading an eye chart. And um, it's the point behind patching is that if you cover up the good eye, then you force the child to use the other eye, um, and then that strengthens the amblyopic eye, and presto, it go the amblyopia goes away. Um, quite a lot of research from uh, cat uh, in first and, and monkey model um, has shown that what often happens in terms of an outcome measure here is that the acuity of the formerly good eye declines while the acuity of the formerly bad eye uh, increases. And sometimes what you end up with is subnormal vision in both eyes. Um, however, um, here's uh, our, our case of uh, congenital cataract again. Um, I just want to point out that, that this child, this is now a six-year-old, um, this child was treated um, with optical correction and patching um, uh, after the cataract was removed. And, and the child still has amblyopia. Um, and, uh, but this particular child had reasonably good contrast sensitivity uh, in the fellow eye. Um, but it was a puzzle as to why you couldn't get um, a normal visual function uh, from, this, from an eye like this. Um, and a whole series of studies were done uh, in the late uh, 1980s and early 1990s by Ron Booth and colleagues at Emory University to try to develop a good animal model uh, for um, cataracts and aphakia, meaning uh, the, ex the lack of a lens in the eye, um, and in the monkey model. Um, and they tried a variety of different things. On the top is just developmental data from uh, typical monkeys. And this just shows that there's nothing wrong with the vision of either eye of these animals. And vision develops normally on, according to this graph. And over here is the interocular difference between the eyes. And all the data look normal. There's no difference. They're centered around zero here. Um, and then uh, in the case of the aphakia, where the lens has been removed in the monkeys, um, you see the developmental profile for the fellow eye and the total lack of development uh, of the aphakic eyes and the difference between the eyes increasing dramatically. And that shows you basically the condition that exists in a child that has the lens taken out but hasn't had proper treatment uh, to, to, uh, to try to get the best vision they can. And so what, what Ron and colleagues did was they tried a variety of different methods to try to figure out what the best treatment method was for these aphakic kids. Um, and what they learned was that full-time patching, um, as is typically done in children, was actually detrimental. Um, and what they came up with in the end was that to provide good optical correction, whether through an interocular lens or an external lens, and part-time patching, um, they had good visual outcomes in their monkeys. And, and if, you're, if you follow this literature at all, you'll, you'll see that in the, the, we're now doing a bunch of prospective um, clinical studies in children to figure out what the best treatment th uh, methods are and best practices for dealing with amblyopia in children. And what they've converged on is exactly this. Part-time patching is the right way uh, to treat children to get the best visual outcome in addition to other, other kinds of measures. Um, and this just shows. Um, uh, reminds me to point out that, of course, any kind of successful treatment will depend on the age at which the treatment is started and the age at which the condition uh, first occurred, um, and, um, and also the starting visual acuity. So if you have a mild amblyope to begin with, it's going to be much easier to get a good visual outcome uh, from, from those kids. So the different colors here are kids in different age ranges, with blue being the oldest. Um, and successive outcome with, with good being uh, near the top. And so the, you get the best outcomes from the youngest kids with the best starting acuity. Makes sense, right? OK. Um, so um, we want to spend just a, a few minutes talking a, a little bit about what the underlying neural mechanisms are, because of course that's something that we can uniquely address uh, in, the, in the macaque model. Um, and so. Um, what I, what I want to just show you is a couple of examples of how um, changes in visual behavior or the deficits that I've told you about relate to changes in the brain. And I'm going to talk about data from V1 uh, uh, right now. But we have data from some other downstream visual areas like MT, uh, v, V2, and V4 that show that deficits persist 
well down the visual pathways, and that in fact there's de novo deficits that, that occur um, further down the visual pathways from V1. But let's just take a look at V1. So um, data from um, single unit and multi-unit recordings um, in macaque monkeys that are board certified amblyopes um, uh, have been made to look at the um, acuity of those neurons, the contrast sensitivity of those neurons, and other aspects of their function. Um, and, and what I'm showing you here are data from just one animal. And on the top are those, that animal's behavioral data. And so these are his amblyopic eye contrast sensitivity data. And in the open symbols, the fallow eye. Um, and on the bottom uh, is the neuronal contrast sensitivity um, that was achieved um, from recordings from that animal when um, the, um, the neurons were driven through the amblyopic eye in the field symbols and the fellow eye uh, in the open symbols. Um, and in order to compare directly um, the extent of the loss behaviorally and that neuronally, we're going to take the difference between the sensitivity, the peak sensitivity of these curves, uh, and compare them, and also between the shift in spatial scale. Um, and we're going to do that for a whole group of animals that were tested using multi-unit array recordings um, in foveal V1. Um, and what I'm showing you here is those interocular ratios, um, and the neuronal measure is on the um, ordinate, the behavioral measure is on the abscissa, and on the left is the peak spatial frequency, so meaning the spatial scale measure, and on the right is the sensitivity measure. Um, and what you can see is, is the data, if, if the losses uh, in the cortex were commensurate uh, with respect to the behavioral losses, the data would all lie along these diagonals. Um, and they don't. Um, and the profile that you see here is that the behavioral losses are more dramatic in most cases um, than the neuronal ones. And what that means is that what we're measuring behaviorally is not yet reflected at the level of the primary visual cortex. There's information available in the primary visual cortex that is either not available to the behavioral output or is not being used for some reason. So basically, the brain's better than the behavior. Where's the information lost is the big question, right? Um, and so why is there this mismatch? Um, and so I want to uh, spend a few minutes now talking about some, uh, some um, data that address a different aspect of amblyopia rather than uh, just spatial vision. And that is to remind us that this is a disorder not just to form vision or um, uh, monocular vision, but it's a disorder of binocular vision. You have a mismatch between the information coming in through the two eyes. And what this illustrates is what you should have in a typical uh, observer, binocular single vision, where you've got a single image uh, when you're looking around the world. And a strabismic over here, for example, um, where you have diplopia. In other words, the information from the two eyes isn't properly converging or if you have defocus in one eye or the other eye. You have a difference between the images in the two eyes. Um, and so that, um, that binocular, that loss of uh, binocular function, is one that was actually highlighted very early on by Hubel and Fiesel when they did their groundbreaking studies uh, on vision and visual development. Um, and uh, one of the things that they identified first in CAT and later in monkey, I'm sure you're all familiar, is the ocular dominance organization in V1 and the binocularity that exists in V1 that doesn't exist earlier in the visual pathways in primates. Um, so this V1 is the, the site of convergence of binocular information uh, in the primate. And what they showed is if you use a monocular deprivation uh, early on uh, in, in a cat or a, in this case a monkey, um, that binocular organization is completely disrupted. Um, and so what you have is an ocular dominance profile that's almost exclusively uh, dominated by the open eye, um, and binocular function is largely gone, and, and neurons are no longer being driven by the, by the amblyopic or the closed eye. Um, and for quite a long time, you know, um, it was presumed that this was, in fact, uh, the neural correlate of, of amblyopia. Uh, but in fact, subsequent studies from Biesel and our, our lab and other labs has shown that um, amblyopia actually can exist um, uh, quite happily 
uh, when you have a balanced ocular dominance histogram. Um, and, and so you have a variety of profiles of ocular dominance histograms uh, that can be found in amblyopic cortex, sort of independently of the depth of amblyopia. Um, and so uh, there's more to it than that. Um, there's a dearth of binocular neurons in, in virtually all cases, though. Um, interestingly, what data from uh, Ron Harworth and Earl Smith and Yuzo Chino uh, showed was that despite the fact that there are very few binocular neurons left in amblyopic cortex in most cases, um, their binocular interactions persist in the brain uh, in, in V1 of amblyopes. Um, and um, what they found was that those interactions tended to be suppressive rather than excitatory. Um, and that was very intriguing because we found a variety of monocular losses um, and not very many binocular neurons, but binocular interactions persisted. So um, Christopher Schooner in our lab became very interested in trying to understand what the nature of those binocular interactions were. And so he did a study to try to address where is this, um, what, what is the, the nature of these suppressive interactions and can you identify them? And he used a protocol that's known as dicoptic masking and I won't go into details about this, but I'll just use a little cartoon to try to illustrate it for you. Um, and so in, in, in natural circumstances, you could present just a grating stimulus to one eye. Um, you know, the, the observer will detect that stimulus at a certain level, or the neuron will fire a certain number of spikes to that stimulus. Um, but if you pair that grating stimulus with a noise stimulus in the other eye, then the response of that neuron or that individual is suppressed. It's de it decreases, um, given the presence of a dicoptic mask. Okay? And so what Christopher did was, to, was exploit that phenomenon and use a variety of conditions stimulating both the good eye independently and the amblyopic eye independently, presenting gratings alone, noise masks alone, um, and dicoptic masking stimuli to try to understand um, the suppressive interactions that might exist in the amblyopes. And this is just a histogram down here um, showing that um, if you had uh, commensurate responses to the dicoptic case that, as to the monocular case, um, the data would all center on one. And they're all below one, which illustrates the suppressive interaction, the, the masking phenomenon. And so what he did was he studied a bunch of uh, amblyopic monkeys recording in V1 and V2. And um, what I'm showing you here, um, just very quickly, is histograms from those animals when the noise mask was presented to the fellow eye, those are the open bars, or the amblyopic eye, and those were the filled bars. And this is the control data, again, showing the classical suppressive interactions that you would expect from dicoptic masking. And the important point here is, in the amblyopes that were the deepest amblyopes, what he found was that you had typical masking behavior when the noise was presented to the fellow eye, but not when the noise was presented to the amblyopic eye, which meant that the amblyopic eye was unable to basically compete well with the fellow eye under dicoptic viewing conditions, which is how your amblyopes are walking around in the world. And this is just a, a summary graph that makes that point. These are these uh, data from the three histograms on the right. And these are all the other data from fellow eye and amblyopic eye and controls. And so what you see is that, um, in fact, um, the, there's asymmetric suppression under typical binocular viewing conditions so that um, the, the amblyopic eye is going to be losing out on a regular basis to the fellow eye. Um, and that might explain why downstream you have um, stronger losses uh, for some of these uh, higher order functions and the, the behavioral deficits that you see um, are actually amplifying um, downstream uh, compared to what's already there, information available there at the level of V1. And one of the things that's um, going on uh, right now is there's a number of new approaches to amblyopia therapy that actually take advantage of the information that's there in the brain that isn't being used, and they're binocular therapies. 
Um, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna have time to really go into them, but they take advantage of the fact that there's information there that you can use, and they try to train the child to do binocular combination and to not suppress the amblyopic eye information. Um, so with that, um, I wanna thank uh, my collaborators in all of this. Um, Tony's been a collaborator uh, throughout a lot of my career, Mike Hawken, um, and some others at NYU. Uh, Howard Eggers uh, is a clinician who created all the amblyopes um, by creating strabismus and, and uh, things like that. Um, and the many postdocs and graduate students who contributed to this work. And of course, the monkeys and the Washington National Primate Center uh, in particular, who has been instrumental in uh, providing animals so my research could go forward. Thank you. <laughs>